This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Remember, all I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. Russell Reed Show. Welcome to the Russell Reed Show. I am Russell Reed. Joining me, my new wingman, Jimmy Scruggs, and our attorney in house, our DOI expert, great guy, friend for a long time, Patrick Quinn. Pat, welcome to the show. Thank you. And tell everybody a little bit about your uh, legal background, where you went to school, and all that good stuff. I graduated from John Marshall Law School, part of Cleveland State University in 1976. Been practicing law for 37 years. I am a nationally board certified trial attorney. I am an expert in blood, breath, urine, field sobriety tests, and the machines. And uh, I can help anybody who's charged with a DUI. And from one fan to the other, what did you do your undergrad? University of Michigan. Woohoo! Go oh, Wolverines! Oh, oh, and 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 we we booked this interview with you uh, last week before everything went down today. For those who have not heard, and throughout the country, have been following the story with the uh, the the abduction of the three young ladies here in Cleveland. Ariel Castro was sentenced today, life in prison, without the possibility of parole. Plus, just to throw the icing on top, a thousand extra years, and. You're fortunate enough to know both attorneys, the prosecutor and the defense attorney. Did they do a hell of a job or what? I think it was the best resolution for all parties involved. Because we were saying on this show, you know, you knew they were going to go for the death penalty for one reason and one reason only, to take it off the table to prevent the girls from having to testify. Well, I think that was the catalyst that that created the plea. And uh, I think that uh, Tim McGinney, our county prosecutor, uh, who's a fine attorney, I've known him for his entire career, he did a great job uh, and was compassionate with the victims in allowing the plea to, to go forward. Craig Weintraub, who represented uh, Mr. Castro, um, I thought he handled this case very, very well. He was sensitive to the victims and yet satisfied the needs of society in, in making sure that Mr. Castro will never be able to engage in this conduct again. And one of the things I was telling people at work, uh, he most likely will be spending the rest of his days in solitary confinement for the crimes he did because he has to serve, uh, uh, what's the word, a cruel and unusual punishment would be putting him in general population where he could be hurt, abused, and all that. Is there any truth to that? You know, I'm not sure, but uh, I'm sure that he would be targeted by other inmates. So his safety, I'm sure, is a concern. Uh, and I, I'm not sure what the – once it gets to the prison system, they do what they want with prisoners. So the law doesn't have any control over what happens once he's delivered to the Department of Prisons. Okay, and uh, we got a lot to go over because DUIs are all over the news. Well, one quick question okay. I do have. I recall somewhere uh, during the trial uh, the daughter that Amanda Berry bore was that – uh, there was a restraining order against Errol Castro? No contact order. No contact order. Yeah. And what does that mean? Well, that means that they're, that they're basically what it says, no contact. You know, family members can't contact the victims. Mm-hmm. No text messages, no phone calls, no emails, no anything. So what about that daughter as far as her going to see him? Well, that was an issue that was raised at one time uh, by the defense to see if she could come visit. And I'm not sure what, how that re- was resolved. I, I thought something having until she's of the age 18, then she's an adult, and then she can go see the. Uh, at that point, she can make her own decisions. Yeah. But at this point, she's a minor, and, and uh, whatever her mom or the court system tells her to do, that's what she's got to comply well, with. Well, I'm glad it was quick and. Yeah. Uh, if you have any questions tonight, 888 um, 668 DUIs and OVIs. Uh, driving under the influence and operating a vehicle impaired, Pat, are, you told me, are one and the same, just different verbiage. Yeah, the old verbiage was DUIs, driving while under the influence of alcohol. The new, new uh, acronym is OVI, 
operating a motor vehicle while under the influence of alcohol. Uh, they both mean the same thing. It's just the statute, is, the language has changed. Okay, and um, just some stats I, I came up with uh, through Cleveland.com. Uh, an alcohol fatality happens every 30 minutes and an injury every two minutes. About half of the arrests are repeat offenders. Two thirds are, are um, under suspended license in the drive anyway. And in Ohio, 400 people will die, 15,000 will be hurt, 20,000 uh, will be arrested a year for OVI and DUI. Um, now, what are, what are our rights? Because there, there's, Everyone thinks when you get pulled over, you have to do a field sobriety test of some sort or the other. Is that true? Uh, it is not true. Uh, first of all, uh, let me explain to you on what the policemen have to comply with, okay? Okay. All right. Policemen can't just pull you over anytime they want to. They have to have what's called probable cause, okay? And probable cause basically would be a traffic violation, running a red light, speeding, weaving, uh, and, they, and they can also come, if you are involved in an accident, to investigate that accident. Uh, now, there are times when they don't need probable cause. For example, a sobriety checkpoint. That takes the probable cause out of it, okay, which is, which is bad from our point of view, okay? Uh, but what they have to do is they have to, in order to be a qualified sobriety checkpoint, they have to comply with some regulations about advertising uh, to the public in newspapers and, and publishing that so people know that there's going to be a sobriety checkpoint. And then basically they don't have to have probable cause. Every car gets stopped or whoever they feel like stopping and there ha doesn't have to be a traffic violation to get stopped in that situation. The same apl would apply to a boating DUI. The Coast Guard can board any boat anytime they want for any reason they want, safety checks and things which uh, to me uh, is not appropriate because they should have probable cause. Uh, so before a policeman can pull you over, there has to be probable cause. That's the first place that you attack a DUI case from a defense point of view. Now, once they pull you over, uh, then, then they're going to approach your car and engage in a conversation, okay? Okay. And the reason they're doing that is because the probable cause they had to pull you over only allows them to pull you over. For example, I'm speeding. Well, they've only got probable cause to give me a speeding ticket. That's it. Okay? Now, they want to engage you in a conversation, especially if it's in the target zone, which is like from midnight to 4 or 5 in the morning. Okay? Because okay. that's what they're looking for is DUIs. Okay? Or OVIs. So what they're going to do is engage you in a conversation. Where are you going? Where are you coming from? You know, what, give me your uh, identification, insurance, registration. And they do that to try to get additional probable cause to charge you with an OVI okay. or to get you out of the car. All that's, right? a, that's a question I got real quick. Now, will they, okay, now let's say you get pulled over by a cop or whatever, and the cop, and you don't roll your window down all the way. And you tell the cop, this is far enough. I don't need to roll my window down anymore. You see all these videos out there on YouTube and Facebook and all that stuff where people don't roll their windows down and the cops get pissed off and bent out of shape and they're claiming civil rights and all this other stuff. Now, is that true? Can You don't have to roll your window down all the way, do you? No. No. Actually, uh, the advice that I would give somebody if they get pulled over is to – Roll down your back window and hand out your license, insurance, and registration, and don't let him engage in a conversation with you, or just slip it out your window. Because once you engage in the conversation, he gets to gather a lot of evidence against you. Mm -hmm. He smells your breath, odor of alcohol. He looks at your eyes, red bloodshot, glassy eyes. He, he uh, hears your speech, slurred, slow, whatever. Those are all indications that you may have been drinking or under the influence. He then asks you questions. Hey, do you have anything to drink? Okay, well, if the window's down and you're in a conversation, you got to be careful because you're natural. You know, we want to cooperate with police, and we should. So if you avoid that situation, then he can't gather any more information, which means he can't get additional probable cause to get you out of that car. Now, it takes a lot of guts to do that because he's going <laughs> to right. threaten to arrest you and say you're not cooperating and all that stuff. But really, if you do it properly, he, there's nothing they can do about it. But then it. he can tell you to roll down your window. Yeah, he can. And, and then you get into an issue of whether or not you're violating a police order or you're, you're engaging in disorderly conduct. And that's always a judgment call. 
Mm-hmm. I'd rather deal with that judgment call than I would giving him probable cause to arrest you for a DUI. Mm-hmm. Now, your your first is uh, what? You, you mean as far as penalties? And yeah, things? Your, your, your first first DUI penalty. Okay, the, uh, DUIs are what, what we call enhanceable in the state of Ohio, and what that means is. The, the first conviction is a minimum three days in jail or three days in a driver intervention program. And what that means is, under the statute, the judge can send you for education, but it is actually three days. You have to go check in at, at, at a Holiday Inn or wherever they're going to give this, this, uh, this uh, educational seminar at on, say, a Thursday night, and you stay there till Sunday, and that's really a substitute for the three days in jail, but it's 72 hours. And you can come and go as you please. No, no, no. you stay there. You stay there, you stay and there for from my understanding, when they lock you in your room, they put tape over there so you know, the, you know they'll walk the hallways to make sure that you don't try to sneak out. That's what I've heard. So there's no going down for room service, right? <laughs> no, 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 no. No, they monitor that. And, and if you don't comply, then it doesn't count as a credit towards the three days. And you won't, you won't get a good report at the end, which means the judge can then penalize you even more. Uh, the minimum penalty on, on a first now, time. Who pays for this? You do. Three hundred <laughs> some dollars too. Wow, that's yeah. an expensive stay at a Holiday Inn. Yeah, and yeah, a lot of people would rather do the three days in jail. But the education you get is is very very good. Mm-hmm. I think it would be good for everybody to take that as a condition of driving, and it really helps people to understand how to watch themselves to make sure they don't get into trouble. You and, know, and don't drive when they're impaired. And, and that brings me to my next question. Uh, God, I know it was this way in the eighties. It was point one zero. The, the legal you know, legal limit, and they dropped it to 0.08. Uh, do you know how many beers or drinks you would have to consume to get a 0.08? It, it depends on a variety of factors. It depends on body mass, weight, basically, how much sleep you had the night before, uh, when you ate the last time, uh, various things like that. If you're taking other medications, if you have any health issues such as diabetes or anything like that, but uh, you know it, it, it varies with everybody. So you have to be careful. It all depends. Uh, there's an ingestion rate for alcohol, which is basically a straight uh, line, straight up in the air, or pretty close to straight. And there's a burn-off rate, which is a much uh, gradual slope. So if you drink beer, you're going to it's going to get into your bloodstream very quick. If you drink mixed drinks, it'll get in very quick. If you drink shots, it'll take longer to get in. How so, I would think shots would be quicker. Yeah. Well, sh- shots are highly concentrated, so it takes a little while to break it down. Oh, okay. okay. So, but but because mixed drinks are mixed with other things that dilute it, it goes in faster. Okay? Gotcha. Now, if you ate, that'll slow down the absorption process. If you didn't eat, it will fast. It will speed up the absorption process. So if you do a couple of uh, quick, you know, drink three or four beers real quick, you're, you're going to be over the limit. And you could be, when I say sober, you could, you know, be coherent and not have any effects, but because you downed it so quick, you know, and you blow within half hour of that, you're over the, you know, you're over the legal limit, but you might be able to pass, you know, the, this field sobriety test. Well, th- this gets a little complicated, but I'm going to try to make it simple, okay? Okay. Um, if the, the question on, on, on uh, the breathalyzer we'll talk about right now, okay, is what was your breath, al- blood, blood, breath, alcohol content at the time you were operating the motor vehicle, okay? Right. Okay. So you get stopped. They do field sobriety tests. They, they do this. They do that. They put you in the vehicle. They get you back to the station. It might be an hour to two hours later. Whatever that test result is at that point isn't what it was at the point you were stopped. Right, because you may have may have ingested more alcohol in that time period, which would raise the the, yeah. the reading. Okay, that's another place we attack these things. Uh, and on the other hand, if you're in the burnoff stage, it might be less. Well, we don't attack that. <laughs> we accept that reading. Okay, right. especially if it's low. And the question is that there are two different types of OVIs in the state of Ohio. Okay, they're, they're under Section 451119. The the what we think of as an OVI. Okay. Uh, the definition would mean that uh, you are the consumption of alcohol impaired your ability to drive. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. So it's not illegal to drink alcohol and drive in the state of Ohio as long as it, the consumption of alcohol didn't impair your ability to drive. 
So if I can have a few drinks, drive home, and I'm fine, okay? Uh, now, if, if I'm impaired, that's when you get convicted of a DUI, all right? Okay. And the way they prove impairment is by field sobriety tests, those observations we just talked about, red bloodshot, glassy eyes, odor of alcohol, slurred speech. Those things are all indications of impairment, okay? So if you, you asked me a question about field sobriety tests, okay? There is no law that requires you to do field sobriety tests, all right? Okay. So my opinion is that you should never do field sobriety tests. And why is that? Well, because all you're doing is, is giving them evidence mm -hmm. against yourself. You're testifying against yourself, okay? Now, let me tell you about field sobriety tests, okay? I am certified in those tests. I took a 24-hour course. And the bottom line is that those tests are designed for failure. They're not designed so you'll pass it and be able to go home and he's going to let you go, all right? You, we've all heard this, you know, try to do these tests when we're sober, and they're yeah. hard to do. <laughs> yeah. Okay? They they're called divided attention tests, which means first they, they tax your physical abilities for balance and things like that. All right? That's one part of it. And then the divided attention part is and then they give you a bunch of instructions while you're trying to maintain a, an awkward position that you have to remember and then repeat. Okay? So, so they're really, it's very difficult testing. All right, and, and the bottom line is that, that it's, it's difficult to do. You're on a road at 2 o'clock in the morning. There's cars flying by. There's lights flashing. So, so the odds are against you, okay? Um, what happened was the, uh, the state patrol figured out that they needed more evidence to prove DUIs, all right? So what they did was they conducted <clears throat> tests. In, uh, they started in San Diego. And then they tried a lot of different tests than what we know today as field sobriety tests to see which ones were the most accurate. And they came up with three of them that basically that they felt were reliable. And one is called an HGN, horizontal gaze nystagmus, okay? And that's the eye test where they tell you to keep your head still and they, and they yeah. move a stimulus back and forth in front of your eyes, okay? And they're looking for the eyes to bounce. <clears throat> a nystagmus is an involuntary jerking of the eyes, right. okay? When we're sober, our, our eyes move smoothly back and forth. If you have a 0 0.10 alcohol content or greater, then your eyes will involuntarily jerk up and down as they're moving. And you can see this, but it's very difficult to see when, you know, even if you've done this for a long time and you're experienced, and especially at night and on the road and under these conditions. So, so I question those results anyway. But, but that test is involuntary. You can't control the way your eyes are going to run. So, so that's left up to officer observation. So what do you think the officer is going to say? <laughs> I saw the nice stagmas, yeah. right? You got the nice stagmas. Now, what's interesting about all of these tests is these tests are not indications of impairment, and it says so right in the National Highway Safety uh, Administration manual. What they're indicative of is a blood alcohol content or breath alcohol content of greater than 0 0.10, which is the limit. Okay. Now, when they did these tests, the last edition of the D DUI Detection and Standardized Field Sobriety Manual was, was from uh, August of 2006. That limit you just asked me about changed. Now it's 0 .08. So, so there's always questions about yeah. <laughs> does it apply? You know, if it, if it indicates 0.10 or greater, uh, then it, does it also apply to 0 .08? And the, and the answer is obvious, yes. Right. If it's a lesser threshold, then sure it would apply to it. Okay. And there's a national movement right now to lower that limit to like 0 .06. And what happens is this: you got all these interest groups, Mothers Against Drunk Driving. All those victims that you talked about yeah. in these, the, the, you know, that are injured and killed in accidents. So there's a big, big lobby against this, okay? And then what happens is the, the our congressmen and our senators feel the pressure from these lobbies and then make the states comply by tying compliance with these lower limits to uh, federal highway funds. So you don't, you don't change your law, you're not going to get your bridges built or maintained or, or roads built. So Strong so, grip. Yeah, 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 it's gonna, it's gonna, they're gonna give it. And, okay. and when when you have cities and states that are bankrupt, and and losing money, Detroit. it's a, it's a nice little cash flow to come in through the court costs and the fines and the reinstatement fees, and, and all that. I I mean, you very, know, very much so. We we can name the, between the three of a few cities around mm -hmm. here that if it's twenty five and you go twenty six, you're getting pulled over. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Um. Let me, wait, let me finish up on these okay. field sobriety tests, okay? 
So that horizontal gaze and nystagmus, now, ironically, that's the most reliable of the three tests, okay? That's 78% accurate. It is, again, it's because you can't fudge it. It's an involuntary yeah, right. response. My problem with that test is in all the tests uh, under the NHTSA standards, they have to be performed in substantial compliance with the manual, you know, with, with how they prescribe to perform them. And what I find is that <clears throat> policemen are sloppy in their technique or they don't follow the standards, so the results are questionable. And then, and then that, that we, I attack that in many cases with what's called a motion to suppress to throw them out, okay? Okay. Now, the second test that's sanctioned by NHTSA is called a walk and turn test, okay? And we've all seen that, okay? Mm -hmm. You stand with your right foot in front of your left, you know, heel to toe, and the policeman says, okay, now walk nine steps out and nine steps back on an imaginary straight line, hands at your sides, count out loud, you know, and don't step off the line, all right? Well, the hardest part of that test is they put you in, in the starting position, which is hands at your side, one foot in front of the other. I got big thighs. I can't stand like that anyway. All right? And then you, you have to maintain that position while they give you a series of like eight or ten instructions, okay? Right. And then they demonstrate it. They have to demonstrate it for you, okay? Oh, okay. All right? So you got to stand in that position for like 30, 45 seconds. That's the hardest part of the test. And they're watching the whole and time. They're watch and, that's, and, and see, they, there are clues. Like, you know, you, you miss a question or something. Well, there are clues that they look for to, so you either fail or pass that test. And that's the first clue. And like I said, you're standing there trying to concentrate on not breaking that position. And then, then you got to listen to all these clues. So if you don't remember everything, you're not going to do the test properly. Okay? Okay. All right. So, so you go do this test, all right? And the policeman's watching you. And, uh, and the road might be uneven or something. You never know. So it's a difficult test to perform. Well, when you're done with that test, and he writes down, or he's supposed to write down, you know, the clues, okay? And there are specific clues. One clue is not touching heel to toe. Well, it's got to be within a half inch each, each step. How is a policeman going to see that in the dark at night on the roadside with all the lights flashing and everything else while he's watching to see if you raise your hands for balance, another clue, whether you count out loud properly, whether you're walking in a relatively straight line, whether you turn properly, whether you step off the line. I, I don't think he, he can do all that, okay? And with traffic coming, and there's always going to be that one person that honks sure, the horn, and sure. you're worried about getting hit. and Sure. And so, so the bottom line is I, I, I find that that test, they either don't give the instructions properly, they don't demonstrate it properly, or they don't score it properly. And scoring is the, the best one to attack from, from my point of view, okay? okay? I'll give you an example. If you don't touch heel to toe, that's one point, right? Okay. Well, Policemen count it as two points, one for the walk out, one for the walk back. Well, that's not accurate. You can't do that under the NHTSA manual, okay? If you step off the line, one clue. But So if you step off the line five times, it's still only one clue, but they'll score it more. Okay. Uh, all right? They say you raise your arms for balance. Well, if you, if you raise them a little bit and not over six inches, it's not a clue. So they'll count the clue anyway. All right? So there are many ways to attack that test. And in the NHTSA manual, there are also, uh, it also says, look, these are difficult tests. So you can't get, you know, if somebody's over 65, they're not going to perform well. Right. If somebody's overweight, they're not going right. to perform well. And if somebody has medical conditions, they can't perform well. Well, they, uh, they you know, uh, typically what I hear is this. The, the policeman says, do you have any medical problems? You can't perform. Yeah, I got a bad back. Yeah, I got a bad knee. I had surgery five years ago. Well, you want to try anyway? Oh, sure, because we all want to cooperate with the police. Yeah, right. You know, that's how we're raised, and that's what we're taught to right, do. Right. And it's the right thing. So you end up getting yourself into trouble. The last test is called a one-leg stand, okay? We've all seen that, okay? You stand with your feet together, hands at your side. You raise one foot six inches straight out, point your toe at, at, I can't up in do the that air. Sober. No. And you count out loud <laughs> by thousands, okay? Now, and they tell you to count until 30 or until I tell you to stop, right? Well, that's a very difficult test to do. Well, okay. until they say stop. Yeah, well, that's that's what they're going to tell you, okay? Okay. But but in that test, there, there, there's, again, there are clues, and sometimes they'll count a clue that doesn't exist. That isn't a clue, clue in the manual, okay? A verbal clue. Well, no. Slurring the 1,000. No, that it, well, the clues are basically if you hop, mm -hmm. if you put your foot down, mm -hmm. okay? If you... Uh, uh, you raise your arms for balance, mm -hmm. okay, and, and not counting properly, okay. Right. So, but but here, let's assume 
that you put your foot down once. Well, that's not the end of the test. You didn't flunk. You could start all, start again, okay? And if you put your foot down once and you complete the test, you've passed that test. How is a 300-pound uh, guy going to do that? He's that, not going to, and that's right. why the manual says that, okay? And, and there are other things that can, you know, overweight is one thing. Right. But if somebody's got a back problem, that's, you know, if somebody's in pain from, from sciatic nerve. A bar or, fight. Well, I, <laughs> bar I, just, fight. I yeah. just had that case. And, uh, and, and this is very interesting, by the way, if I, if I can digress for a second. Guy gets in a bar fight, gets his ass. You gets, can say it. Gets his ass kicked, okay? Right. He has a concussion. Uh-oh. All right? <laughs> he gets it. Now, he doesn't remember leaving the bar. Right. He gets in his car and drives. He doesn't remember getting stopped. He doesn't remember doing field sobriety. He doesn't remember anything, okay? Well, I get the, I, I send him to the hospital immediately, immediately, get the diagnosis, and it's a concussion. Well, a concussion mimics the signs of inebriation. Right. Slow, slurred speech, um, you know, forgetful, don't know what's going on, failure to follow directions, lack of balance, sensitivity to eyes, all those things. That's a good defense to use. Okay? Did the guy get off? Uh, yes. <laughs> he yes. smiles. Yes. So get in a bar fight before you get in the car. Well, oh. <laughs> like like I told Pat, twenty years of football, knees are shot. Well, again, if you tell him I I can't do the test because of physical reasons, then that's it. But everybody, you know, they'll say, hey, yeah, I got bad knees. Well, you want to try it anyway? Yeah, I'll try. But can't they hold that against you though? Well, if you volunteer and say, you know, once you tell them you got an injury or you're overweight or, or I've got diabetes and, and, and I'm getting lightheaded, I can't do these tests, or, or I've got a, a cere- uh, you know, I just had a concussion a week ago and I, you know, I'm having difficulty with balance, you're off the hook. But if after you t- disclose that information, then you take the test, the test can be held against you. There was a guy recently in, in the news um, who was stopped and told the officer that he did have medical conditions and was basically not forced but required to complete it and he was and he was completely dead sober they came back to the uh police station he blew zero but they still scored him because he said i have a medical condition i'm on medication i can't perform these they still asked him to perform it well, and he, and he said he was being pulled ask. over for being black, if you recall that one. Oh, I do. I do remember that. Yeah. But, but here's the deal. The policeman is trained to make arrests, mm-hmm. okay? He's not pulling you over because, because he wants to let you go. He's pulling you over to arrest you. Right. All right? In, in, in my opinion, once you're pulled over, you're going, you're going to be charged. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think there's any way out of that. So it doesn't matter what you do. The only thing you can do is put yourself in the best position, and that's by not taking the field sobriety test. You'd be polite and cooperative and say, I'm just not going to do it. You know, don't don't get into an altercation or anything, right. and, and don't let anybody coerce you to do it because there's no law that says you must take those tests. Right. It's all voluntary. But they, they won't tell you that. They'll tell you, if you don't take them, I'm going to arrest you. Well, in my opinion, you're getting arrested anyway because right. he's got you out of the car, and he's already made his decision. Okay. So I wouldn't do that. And the breathalyzer, same thing. Breathalyzer, there is a legal requirement to take a breathalyzer in the state of Ohio. And, and let me explain that to you. Okay. okay? So I, I can't advise anybody not to, to follow legal requirements, all right? In the state of Ohio, driving is a privilege. It's not a right, okay? Mm-hmm. When we go get our driver's license when we're 16 years old, we sign a bunch of forms. And one of those forms is called implied consent. And what that says is as a condition of maintaining our driver's license, we agree to take a breathalyzer if we're ever asked to do so, Okay. okay. And so, so if you don't take that breathalyzer, you're going to get some license suspension. You're going to have some penalties from the Bureau of Motor Vehicle and things, okay? That's the one side of it, okay? That's, that's the legal aspect of it. Let's look at the other side, okay? The field sobriety test, like I said, if you take them, you really testify against yourself, all right? There's a second section under the DUI statute, 451119A1H, okay, which is called BAC, blood alcohol content. And under that section, that's where the legal limit comes in, the .08. And under that section, you don't have to prove impairment. You have to prove that the person was operating a motor vehicle with a blood alcohol content greater than .08. So if you take that test and you register over the limit, you're going to get a second DUI charge, which is the BAC, and it's going to be extremely difficult to defend. Okay? okay. At that point, you have to find somebody with my skills that's an expert that can get around the machine results. Okay? And you can fight those machines, and there's.
36 Department of Health regulations that they have to comply with. But you've, you've, you've doubled your exposure and you've lessened your odds of being able to successfully defend this case. Now, is this the uh, machine that they use out in the field when you get pulled over? They say, well, in this or the one back of the station, which is it? Well, they're, 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 those are two different types of machines. And we'll come back. We're going to take our first break. We'll be back. Hold that thought. We'll ask it again, get the answer in just a few minutes. This is the Russell Reed Show with Pat Quinn, DUI expert. We'll be back in a minute. Till the gates are open, I just want to feel this moment. You're listening to Morning Show Central Radio Network. The following message is for those with a credit score of 800 and below. Who wouldn't want better credit? Did you ever wonder how different life would be from just having a higher credit score? Are you tired of being turned down for any kind of loan or only offered high interest rates because your credit score is holding you prisoner? Life doesn't have to be that way anymore with access to Turn Score. By increasing your credit score only 50 to 100 points, it can potentially save you tens of thousands of dollars in interest over just a 5 to 10 year period. It can be the difference in getting approved for a personal loan, business loan, high limits on credit cards, a brand new car lease, or even a home mortgage. We see so many ads from companies that give us our credit score, but once we get our credit score, what are they going to do to actually repair your credit? Unfortunately, nothing. Until now, TurnScore is the first automated credit repair platform that is simple, safe, and secure. You'll be empowered right from the comfort of your own computer, so you can challenge and repair your credit report to ensure it's fair and accurate. Turn score is specifically developed with you in mind. There's no more need for an attorney, credit repair companies, or credit counseling. More importantly, no more need for paying higher fees. Turn score will help you get back on track and get the buying power you need. So whether you have bad credit, average credit, or even good credit, Turn score is helping turn lives around one credit score at a time. Go to turnscore.com and enter the promo code MSC20 and get 20 bucks off your purchase. That's T U R N S C O R.com. T U R N S C O R.com. Turnscore.com. Looking for reliable and affordable shoutcast audio or video hosting? JWN Media offers complete shoutcast hosting solutions for business or personal use. All plans come with full listener stats, custom web scripts for implementing your service into your existing website, full server control, super fast network, and huge bandwidth limits. A 99.5% uptime guarantee and friendly, knowledgeable support personnel dedicated to making your hosting experience fun and easy. With plans starting at only $3 a month, you have no excuse not to get a server of your own. Plus, with the option to add auto DJ and on-demand services, you can be confident your station will be all it can be. Custom plans are also available at their website. Simply visit jwnmedia.com and click the Shoutcast hosting link to get started right now. Hey, local bands and unsigned artists. What if I told you there was a place in Cleveland where you can get your merch made and have it sold in one location? What if I said you could bring your CDs and tickets to upcoming shows to this location? And what if I said you could do live acoustic sets at this location? I bet you're thinking there's no such place in Cleveland. Guess what? You'd be wrong. Contact Rick Navario at Rock City Cleveland and tell him you need merch made and you want to sell it in his store. Now how cool is that? You can tell your fans to come down and get your stuff. And I think he'd ship your products to your fans. And he's local. Contact Rick Navario at Rock City Cleveland today. 216-622-0377. That's 216-622-0377. If you have a product or service, let people know about it. Get your message out there and advertise on MSC Radio Network. It's easier than you think. And the whole planet is listening. Find out how you can advertise. Email Chris at MorningShowCentral.com. I knew something was wrong when a little pretty white girl ran into a black man's arm. You're listening. You're listening to Morning Show Central Radio Network. 99 Technologies. Affordable and reliable web hosting done right. Jumping from one web host to another can be frustrating. Finding a good web host can be unnerving for even the most experienced of web designers. That's why Uncensored Net Noise has chosen P99 
Hosting Technologies as its web hosting supplier. Established in 1999, Pete99 Technologies has evolved into a first-class web hosting provider. Its 99.9% .9 uptime rivals many in the industry. That's why they offer their 30-day guarantee, no questions asked. For more information, go to Pete99.com. Pete99 Technologies will help you get started with your web presence with honest and expert customer service. Pete99 Technologies, affordable and reliable web hosting done right. If you're looking for the best in musical equipment, recording gear, sound reinforcement, and more, Guitar Center has you covered. Guitar Center, located at 26635 Brook Park Road in North Olmsted, has the tools of your trade. With the largest selection of music and sound gear in the area, they cater to your musical needs and have the knowledge to help you out. Guitar Center in North Olmsted. MorningShowCentral.com uses them. You should too. Need to know more? Go to GuitarCenter.com. Call the show toll-free, 1-888-668-0742. You're listening to Morning Show Central Radio Network on MorningShowCentral.com. With hundreds of live weather products and layers and thousands of combinations, Weather Studio provides a professional graphics and storm monitoring solution without complex user knowledge and without the industry standard price tag of $1,000 plus broadcast systems. Weather Studio displays a plethora of critical atmospheric and geophysical data on an interactive GIS-enabled computer map. Get your free 14-day trial of Weather Studio at their website, weatherstudio.paulmarv.com. That's weatherstudio.com. Paulmarv.com. Lakewood Computer, located at 14035 Madison Avenue in Lakewood, has it all. If you're in need of computer repairs or want to cut the cost of ink cartridges and printing supplies, count on Lakewood Computer in Lakewood, Ohio to provide it all. For the past five years, Lakewood Computer has been providing you with a huge assortment of computer equipment and services at very competitive prices. Lakewood Computer purchases and sells pre-owned desktops, laptops, and related equipment, and they offer out Outstanding prices on aftermarket printing supplies, including toner cartridges and ink cartridges. With 29 years of professional experience, Lakewood Computer is highly confident in their ability to enhance your overall computing experience. Check them out online at joeslakewoodcomputer.com. That's joeslakewoodcomputer.com. Or give them a call toll-free, 855-580-0768. That's 855-580-0768. Oh, wow. Language. Okay, he was PMSing. You're listening to Morning Show Central Radio Network. I know, I know, oh my god, I know what we're gonna do. Oh, it's so delicious, I can almost taste it. If you're looking for the best sub shop in town, look no further. Hanini Subs, located at 7310 Lorraine Avenue, is the place for you. Stop in for a cold cut sub, cheeseburger and fries, wing dings and fries, and so much more. And almost taste it. Hanini Subs at 7310 Lorraine Avenue is open 24 hours a day. Check them out on Facebook, facebook.com slash burrito crazy. And if you mention MSC Radio Network, you'll get a dollar off your meal. It's all good at Hanini Subs. So damn good. Welcome back to the Russell Reed Show. Joining me, Jimmy Scruggs and DUI expert Patrick Quinn. Next week's show... Be a zoo. We got the cast of Candyland coming in. Local movie done here. That'll be that'll be fun. Uh, be before trip. before the break, you asked Patrick a, a great question. Uh, the question was the, the breathalyzer on the scene as opposed to at the station. Yes. Here's the deal: the breathalyzer on the scene is called a PBT, portable breath test. It looks like an iPod, and it's got in the. He puts a little mouthpiece on it and asks you to blow into mm -hmm. it. Okay. Now. <clears throat> that is not admissible in court because there's questions about the accuracy of, of that device scientifically. If you take that test and it blows anywhere near the limit, you're going to get arrested, okay? By the time he's asked you to take that test, you're probably going to jail anyway and be going to be charged. So I don't recommend that you take that test, all right? Now, once they get you to the station, they're going to ask you if you want to take a breath test. And there are severe consequences if you don't take a breath test. Okay, you're gonna lose your license for a period of time. You're gonna. Uh, How long is that for? Well, on a first offense, it's it's if you if you don't take the breath test, you're gonna lose your license for a minimum of thirty days. Thirty days. Okay, and first that's, time. That's hard time. Okay, now 
If you get charged, whether you take that test or not, your license is going to be suspended because they're going to give you what's called an ALS, Administrative License Suspension, on the spot. They're going to take your license and you're not going to be able to drive. So whether you take that test or don't take that test, I'm going to go and get you driving privileges. Now, some courts give them after 15 days, which is the minimum. Some courts give them after 30 days. Some courts I can stay the ALS or appeal the ALS and get them for you right away under certain circumstances. So my point is, whether you take that breathalyzer or not, your license is going to be suspended. So there's no benefit to taking that breathalyzer, especially if you think you're going to blow over the limit. Now, if you do take a breathalyzer and it's over the limit, you're going to be charged, obviously, and the prosecutor is going to think they have a slam dunk case. However, I know how to attack breathalyzer machines. We have two in the state of Ohio. One's called an intoxilizer 8000. That's a new machine. It's a suspect. There is two different, you blow two times within a minute or so, it's redundant so that they can, and then they take the lowest of the two blows, and that's what your, your result is. Um, in that machine, there are all kinds of problems with that under the Ohio Administrative Regulations, and, and you can appeal that. Unfortunately, uh, it came into play in January of 2012, and now many courts have ruled that scientifically reliable. However, you can attack that particular machine in your particular test, and there's lots of ways to do that. The Datamaster 5000 is a much more reliable machine, but every machine has error. Every machine malfunctions, so there's always a way to attack it if you've taken that test. The real danger in taking the breathalyzer is if you're trashed and you blow over a .17, that's called a high-tier DUI, and all the mm. penalties double. Ooh. Okay? Oh. So a first offense, it's a minimum three days up to six months. Now you're looking at six days, and you're looking at a year license suspension. If you're a second offender, it's a minimum of 10 days, you know, six months to a year license suspension. And so you're doubling those penalties. So you have to be very careful of putting yourself in a really bad position. Okay? So 0.08, 0.16, you're just going double, double, double. Well, it, it, the, the high tier mi minimum blow is a 0.17. So it's, it's a 0.17. So that's the max. You're getting it all. No, you're doubling the penalties if you get that. Okay. But even if you blow over that, I, I got guys that have blown high twos and threes. And you know what? I, I <laughs> They're love, alive? I <laughs> love those because that that tells me if I got a video and that guy's walking and talking, right? then that machine's wrong, isn't it? Uh, yeah. It's easy to, for me to Is argue that to a jury. Is it possible that someone has a tolerance that they can drink that much beyond what a normal person can drink? And, and as uh, like a true alcoholic, they can <clears throat> function normally. That's true. When they're that intoxicated. That's true. I had a guy that blew a .4. Mm -hmm. Okay. Should have been passed out, dead, comatose, alcohol poisoning. And this guy was walking and talking on the video. And he was, but but he had been an alcoholic for a long time. That's and, the highest I've ever seen. Yeah, he blows that high. Apparently, the machine's not right if he blew a point four. He yeah. should not be with us right now. <laughs> That's the argument. But. That's the argument. Yeah. However, and and we were talking <clears throat> during the break. Certain states, it is legal to consume marijuana, not to drive. But how would you, if you were pulled over after smoking marijuana? And you get pulled over, and these what is it the same as a DUI? <clears throat> yeah, the statute reads under the influence of alcohol and or drugs. Okay, and even if you're taking prescription drugs, you could be charged with a DUI. And the reason that is is prescription drugs have to be taken according to the dosages right. and the time periods prescribed. Okay. So, if you take more than you're supposed to, or you know, not within the, the prescribed time periods. Or there's a pocket insert on all, all the drugs that we get dispensed at a pharmacy, and they usually say, do not consume alcohol. Right. Do not, do not drive a motor vehicle, vehicle, all those things, yeah. okay? So when a cop gets you and he takes you to the station, you blow a zero, and he still thinks you're drunk, you're going to get charged. And they're going to say it's, it's marijuana or it's other drugs or abuse of a prescription. And if they do a urine test, they'll find the levels of marijuana or any other drug that's in your system. Um, and they can do a blood test, which will show anything in your system. Okay. I took a, 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 a analytical chemistry course at Axion Labs in Chicago, Illinois, for uh, 10 days. And I am trained in gas chromatography, mass spectrometry. And that's how they test these things. Okay. Now, when a lab test comes back and says, you've got 
opiates in your system or you've got pot in your system or you've got this level of prescription drugs, which is higher than the prescribed dosage, the prosecutor's going to think he's got a slam dunk. Well, the reason I took these courses is because I challenge every lab result. Labs are highly regulated. They have protocols. They, you have to get their CVs. There's a, many opportunities for contamination because mm -hmm. they might run 150 samples at okay. a time. Right. Yeah, they have to be refrigerated. They have to, there has to be a chain of evidence. So just because there's a blood test or a urine test, that doesn't mean you can't defend and win it successfully win that case. Okay. So you have to be able to challenge those things. And that's why I educated myself because, you know, in most cases, you, you see the lab result and you think, well, it's, it's over. You know, there's nothing right. we can do about and it. And how many attorneys in Ohio are, are certified to be able to do what you do? I know that I'm the only one who has these credentials from where the labs I've been to. Now, somebody else may have taken a course. I don't know that, but, okay. but I don't see it advertised anywhere. Okay, we're going to jump to another area. This is all good news for the first-time offender. Now we got the local people, and we all know someone that maybe got hit four or five times. How easy is it to defend them? It's, well, it depends on how many times you've got them, okay? I'll give you an example, okay? Remember I told you uh, uh, DUIs are enhanceable, okay? Yes. Well, there's a six-year window. And if you have two and six years, the penalty is much more severe. If you have three and six years, you're looking at, uh, you know, minimum 30 days in jail, extended house arrest, mandatory alcohol and drug treatment, uh, long-term license suspension, yellow plates, intoxilizer in your vehicle when you can drive, okay? The party plates. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, when you get past that, now you're into felony stages, okay? Okay. And uh, I'll give you an example. If you have five prior convictions in a lifetime, that's felony, okay? All in right? a lifetime. In a life. Well, that, that's how they're going to look at it, okay. okay? Okay. But there's also what's called a specification, okay? So uh, within 20 years, okay? So if you get charged as a felony, they have to list every one of your convictions in the indictment, okay? Which means that that jury is going to hear about all those prior convictions, okay? This can be very difficult for a juror not to think, he did it all these times, of course he did it this time. So you have to be very careful how you avoid there, how you, how you qualify those jurors. And you have to commit them that they will only decide that case based on the facts of this particular situation. I defended a guy with a, a fifth death felony DUI, or I'm sorry, a third felony DUI, which meant he had like seven altogether. Okay. Got him off on it because this particular time he was not under the influence. Okay. Now, what I had to do with that jury was say, look, you know, the most natural thing for you to think is he did it all these times because you see it in the indictment. So he must have been doing it this time. He's an alcoholic. That's what he does. He drinks. And it was very difficult to get them to, to really just look at the facts in this particular case. Now, if you got a third time uh, mis or a misdemeanor, it's a second or a third time, you can prevent that evidence from coming in front of the jury because it's not part of the charge. Okay. Okay? Yeah. So you have to be very diligent and file the correct motion so that a jury doesn't hear that because, uh, you know, once they hear that, it, it just creates an impression. It's right there. Yes. And how easy, I, I, I don't want to use the word easy, a DUI with a vehicular homicide. Terrible, tragic cases. I mean, no one wants to to do it, but I mean, how do you how as an attorney how would you attack something like that? Try to I mean, there is a death that's that that's inevitable. You got to deal with that, but you try to get the DUI part eliminated. That's the only way you can attack it because you can't change the death. Um, I represented a woman who uh, a motor he was she was turning on a Sunday afternoon with her kids in the back seat. She was house hunting. Missed the street she wanted to turn on, turned around and turned into the street. And a motorcycle was in a dip of the road, came up as she was in the middle of a turn, smacked into the side of the car, and the guy was killed. Now, that went to the grand jury, but she was cold, stone, sober. You know, she felt terrible, never mm -hmm. had any problems in the past. And there's a misdemeanor uh, vehicular homicide, okay? okay? And we got her a misdemeanor on that case. When they're charged with a, a felony... For someone running into her. Well, but, but she was making a left-hand turn, and she was negligent. Okay. So right. that's, that's why, okay? okay? Uh, but if there's a felony, and, and there has to be an aggravating circumstance, which is be the OVI, yeah. the influence of drugs, okay? Otherwise, it's just a vehicular homicide, which is still very, very serious, and yeah. there is a loss of a life. 
But the only way you can attack an aggravated is you have to beat the DUI part of it because then that takes the aggravated out of there, okay? Okay. okay. Um, and there are times you can't, you know, every case depends on itself. But uh, I, I have a case right now. Two young guys were, were going to a technical institute. They were both from uh, Pennsylvania. They went out uh, to celebrate. They were graduating, and they they were driving a, a sports car. One of the, They were revving it up and stuff, and, and they missed a turn and hit a tree. Both of the boys had brain damage. The police weren't even sure who was driving at the time. They both were in the hospital for an extended period of time and then rehabilitation. And finally, they charged one of the boys with aggravated vehicular homicide or vehicular uh, assault. That that it's assault when somebody's just very okay. hurt and it's substantial physical harm. Well, obviously there's substantial physical harm here. And my approach to this case is is several different things. One is the human human factor. These guys are friends. They went out. You know, nobody intended for this to happen. Don't ruin the boy's life. Who who you know lost control of his vehicle, you know uh, you know it's unfortunate and it's it's sad, but but let's not put him in prison and add insult to injury. Mm-hmm. Let's get him some rehab and let's help him out and let's get him back on track. Uh, the other argument is, uh, you know, you can do an accident reconstruction and see why that happened. It might have been a, some problem with the vehicle or something. And in this particular case, they never figured out who was driving because the, the both bodies or both yeah bodies were in the back seat at the time. And on the scene, one policeman said this guy was driving, one policeman said that guy was driving. So there's there's a lot of different issues you can go with. And, you know, it's just the tragedy of a lost life. It's just, it's a terrible thing, you know? Yeah. Everybody feels bad, whether, whether, whether you were drunk or not, you know? And for, you know, people that 20, 25 times, you know, I, I you know, I, Give you all, all the publicity I can when I you know go to bars. I hand out your cards and, and all that. And some of them, why why would you help him out? He he you know he's helping bad people out. Well, um, I, I've done this long enough that you know alcoholism and drug addiction are terrible diseases. People don't wake up in the morning and say I want to be an alcoholic or I want to be a drug addict. That's that's what I want to do with my life. And what happens is, you know, when this happens to somebody, there's a thing called denial, and people don't realize that they've got this problem. They're the last people, and everybody around them knows it because of the way they act and things. And it's very difficult to overcome that addiction or that alcoholism. And treatment, you know, relapse is common. So you you can't give up on these people. You have to try. All right, and, and, and what I do is I provide the best defense I can for them and then let a jury determine whether or not they're guilty and how they should be punished. Uh, but everybody's entitled to be presumed innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Right? And hoping that, you know, they'll after the trial they'll get the help that they... What I actually do with my people is sometimes if there are multiple offenders, I'll say, look, I can help you, but here's what you have to do. You have to go take an, get into an intensive outpatient program, or you have to go for inpatient treatment, or you have to go to AA meetings or something to demonstrate that you're making an effort. And, and it's to their benefit to deal with their disease, and it's to their benefit to, to get a lesser sentence and show to the courts or to the judge that they've acknowledged the problem and that they're working towards re- a resolution of it. Okay, and we, we were talking earlier about voting. And the Coast Guard has the right to board any time they want. International waters. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, I, I don't think that they have the right to board in international waters unless they, you know, there's contraband or something along those lines. Uh, but I do know on Lake Erie, if they want to board your boat, they're boarding your boat. Okay. okay. And what happens is once they get on the boat, they're going to say, we're doing a safety check. Oh, okay. We want to make sure you're always... So like a car, they need. Pro- yeah. they just want to make sure you have your life preservers, you have this, you have that. Exactly. And, and the bottom line is, is when you get the boat, when you register your boat, you again consent to the Coast Guard getting on your boat anytime for a safety check. Right. Then once they get on the boat, they're going to, you know, they're going to check your breath and your eyes, see if there's drinks around, how you're acting. And then they can take you and make you take a breathalyzer too. Okay? Okay. Now, it's interesting because because there's questions about how that would affect your driver's license, okay? Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, you know, because you're not operating on the streets and highways, 
you, there, you, you probably can be able to avoid a driver's license suspension. However, you know, it depends on the court you're in. Right. I had a, a question. Someone texted me why they just didn't bother to call. I have no idea. Um, <laughs> they want to know that, uh, like you brought up, the gentleman uh, from Vegas was swimming. Right. Bl uh, bloodshot eyes. If you're having, if you're a diabetic, every now and then if your insulin is too high, too low, like you said, you get a little out of it and you don't really know what's going on, how do you, I mean, you're, I, I'm you a type had, 2 diabetic. I always had a drink or not had a drink? Right. I always keep my, uh, my Glyburide and my Metformin somewhere on me when I know I have to take it at a certain time. If you're on medication... And it's on you, and you, you do all this. What could they get you with possession charges? I don't think so, as long as it's prescribed and it's for uh, for diabetes. But there are a lot of medical defenses. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, for example, that HGM test. Yeah. You ever hear of a lazy eye? Yep. Yeah. You know, that they can't do the test. It's an invalid test if you have a lazy eye. It's called strabismus, strabismus and amblyopia. Okay. Glad you said that. Yeah, so so <laughs> I check I check people's you know ophthalmology records. If you're a diabetic and your blood sugar is going down, you're going to demonstrate the same symptoms of somebody who's trashed. Right. Okay. You'll be incoherent. You won't. You're, you're, you'll be all over the road. Things like that. I just had a case like that. I got dismissed because we we got his, his medical records and showed that. And the guy actually was racing to get home to get his his uh, insulin. Yeah. And he didn't have it on him. Okay. But but he almost caused a lot of accidents and was driving very erratically. Okay, yeah. uh, like I told you, the head injury. Okay, mm -hmm. that that's a very good excuse because your eyes are screwed up when you you suffer a concussion, and and your speech you're forgetful. You might be slow and slurring your words. You know, unbalanced and things like that. There are many many defenses that we can look at. There's 37 different medical reasons that cause nystagmus other than alcohol consumption. 37. 37. Rattle yeah. off a couple. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> we need this information for the audience. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, paraphrasing, we have just a few minutes left. Your advice, if you get pulled over, be polite. Yes. Be courteous. Yes. Do not take a field sobriety test. Nope. Do not take a breathalyzer test. I can't advise people not to take it, but but I've told you what the pros and cons pros are. Pros are, cons are. Yeah. And first and foremost, after that, number four should be number one, call you, give your information for people. Um, I'm located in Willoughby Hills, Ohio, 2802 Psalm Center Road. My phone number is 440-516-3800. Website? You know what? Uh, if, you go, <laughs> if you go to DUI.com. You'll find out everything you want about okay. me. You can also go to a site called avvo, A-V-V-O dot com, and you can read the, the evaluations people, former clients, have, have made and make an informed decision. And um, real, quick, real quick, give that okay. number one more time. People in the chat didn't get it. The phone number? Yes. Yeah, yeah. 440-516-3800. And when doing some research, they had Ask a DUI Attorney – is that a good place to get information? Are, are attorneys actually at the other end of that? Um, that would be on the AVO site, I okay. believe. And, uh, yeah, people who subscribe to that should be knowledgeable. Okay. Right? And but you need to know every court has different procedures about for getting uh, driving privileges, uh, for doing the three-day driver intervention program. Uh, so you need to know, get a lawyer who's familiar with the, the court you're mm -hmm. going to be in. Um, you know, in my uh, representation, I'm friendly with every everybody at every court uh, I, because sometimes you need a paper, some paperwork pushed through because somebody's got to get back to work or they're going to lose right. their job. Yeah. Sometimes you need to stay in ALS so that that person doesn't have to wait 15 days because of some, you know, pressing family matter or a medical emergency. So you need to be able to walk in and talk to somebody who will be receptive and, and you know, help you. Okay, and uh, on, your ba on your business, what percentage is DUI right now? Probably 70%. 70%? Yeah. And is, is, is it getting higher or lower? Well, 
about five years ago, I started doing this, and it was probably 50%. But, uh, but I, I've got great skills, and I've got a lot of experience, and, and I enjoy this work, and I can help people. Okay. You know? I can put their mind at ease when they call. You know, and, and I explain to everybody, look, if you get a DUI, you're not a bad person. You were in the wrong place at the wrong time, and you made a mistake, so give yourself a break and don't dwell on it, okay? We'll get you the best way possible your life will become normal and move on and you won't get the party plates the the first time around they're they're, they're optional okay they're optional but okay. but anybody i represent doesn't get them okay and i thank you again there's so much we haven't covered would you like to come back sometime and, and anytime just, thank you very much jimmy we'll see you next week Absolutely. next week we got candyland cast and crew and again go blue go browns <laughs> Patrick, thank you very much. You're welcome.